Today we're looking at a poem from the Love and Relationships Cluster. We're going to be looking at Porphyria's Lover by Robert Browning. I don't think you're ready. Brace yourselves. This poem is about a meeting between two lovers. The girl leaves her engagement party to go and meet her secret lover. When she gets there, the man is unable to cope with his emotions, so he strangles her. Then he proceeds to spend all night with her corpse and appears to be more in love with her when she's dead than when she was alive. It is a very disturbing poem. It's quite long, it's quite complicated, so we're going to go through it together. Let's have a read. The rain set early in tonight. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm top down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. I listened with heart fit to break when glided in porphyria straight she shut the cold out and the storm and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm which done she rose and from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl and laid her soiled gloves by untied her hat and let her damp hair fall and last she sat down by my side and called me when no voice replied, she put my arm about her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare and all her yellow hair displaced and, stooping, made my cheek lie there and spread over all her yellow hair, murmuring how she loved me. She, too weak for all her heart's endeavour to set its struggling passion free from pride and vainer ties dissever, and give herself to me forever. But passion sometimes would prevail, nor could tonight's gay feast restrain a sudden thought of one so pale, for love of her and all in vain. So she was come through wind and rain. Be sure I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud. At last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell, and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and took all her hair in one long yellow string. I wound three times her little throat around and strangled her. No pain felt she, I'm quite sure she felt no pain. As a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily opened her lips. Again laughed the blue eyes without a stain, and I untightened next the tress about her neck. Her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. The smiling rosy little head. So glad it has its utmost will, that all it scorned at once is fled, and I, its love, am gained instead, Porphyria's love. She guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard. And thus we sit together now, and all night long we have not stirred, and yet God has not said a word. Hmm? This poem is messed up on many different levels. Now it is a bit complicated in parts to exactly understand what's going on so I'm going to take you through section by section and along the way I'm going to pick my three favourite juiciest quotations and what I mean by juicy is a quotation that has an interesting language device or a word that you can zoom into so that if this poem comes up in your exams you can write at least three detailed analytical paragraphs about it. Let's start from the beginning. Browning begins by setting the scene. The negative weather and setting displays the speaker's own mood. 
It says the rain set early in tonight, the sullen wind was soon away, it tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. I want to analyse this quotation, so I want you to copy it down on your sheet of paper and let's make some notes. The poem begins with pathetic fallacy. The rain came early before it was expected and that foreshadows the surprising events that are going to occur later in the poem. Now this setting of the night creates a dark night, dark and sinister atmosphere and it also hints that the speaker is in an unhappy and pessimistic mood. There is personification of the sullen wind and that shows the speaker's own misery and depression which he is projecting onto the weather. The wind violently tears down the elm tops for spite and there is aggressive violence here and personification which demonstrates that the wind is being malicious and targeting the trees and all of this reflects and mirrors the speaker's psyche. The vindictive nature of the wind is also shown in the verb vex as the lake is a still and silent victim of this attack which mirrors Porphyria's later passivity. It then says I listened with heart fit to break when glided in Porphyria. Now his emotional instability as he listens to the storm outside, his heart that's ready to break, is juxtaposed with the entrance of Porphyria, which is elegant. The verb glided suggests how entranced he is with her. She is presented like an angel. And then Porphyria immediately changes the speaker's mood as well as the atmosphere in the cottage. It says straight, she shut the coals out and the storm and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm. I feel like we could analyse this. This is a good quotation to talk about in your exam. The adverb straight illustrates the immediate nature of Porphyria's positive changes and it shows how the speaker's mood is quickly uplifted as soon as he sees his lover. There is sibilance in straight she shut, which creates a really soft sound and that could display Porphyria's elegance and her grace as if she has ethereal qualities. However, if I was to give you a different interpretation, I could say that sound, it creates a really frightening and secretive tone, foreboding his later actions. Now the use of references to temperature are used to show that Porphyria is almost like a saviour figure. She warms up the cottage despite the cold outside. And metaphorically, she warms the speaker's sad and bleak emotional state. It is very clear that her presence is comforting for the speaker. And then there's the verb kneeled. It displays the speaker's power over Porphyria. She's submissive to him, kneeling in front of him. Although the narrator hasn't even said a word, she instantly sets about to do domestic chores, light the fire, do all this stuff for him in an attempt to cheer him up. And I would argue that there's also religious imagery in kneeling because you kneel in church or you kneel before God. So it's as if she's worshipping him and giving him this elevated status and it reveals his narcissism. Cheerless great has personification and it highlights the bleak nature of the setting. Just like the speaker, the cottage is suffering too. It's neglected, it's not looked after. And it says, which done, she rose and from her form withdrew her dripping cloak and shawl and laid her soiled gloves by, untied hat, let the damp hair fall. Now this is really interesting. The entire poem is narrated from the lover's perspective. So when he's listing all the items she removes, her cloak, her shawl, her gloves, one by one, it symbolises how closely he is observing her. He's watching her every move. And Porphyria is clearly comfortable with him because she even unties her hair and lets it fall, which was considered sinful in Victorian times because there was a perception that letting your hair down was like sexually enticing. And the soiled glove is also a symbol of sexual corruption 
as it juxtaposes the Victorian obsession with purity and cleanliness. So this implies that Porphyria's relationship with the narrator was of a sexual nature. He says, and last, she sat down by my side and called me. When no voice replied, she put my arm about her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare. Browning emphasizes the speaker's sinister nature through his silence when no voice replied. That's his own voice that he is talking about that doesn't reply. And it shows that he has almost become detached from himself and Porphyria attempts to put him at ease through being intimate with him. And it says, all her yellow hair displaced and stooping made my cheek lie there and spread over all her yellow hair. The repetition of Porphyria's yellow hair at this stage is a part of her attempt to seduce and appease the narrator. However, it does take on another significance later on. So it also serves to foreshadow the narrator's obsession with her beauty. If you wanted to, we could obviously zoom into that color imagery of yellow, the fact that it has connotations of youth and happiness and hope. And we could probably then talk about that later on when we find out what he did with her hair. Now the next section then says, murmuring how she loved me. She too weak and it goes all the way down and give herself to me forever. So there is the verb murmuring in this bit, and it shows that Porphyria is speaking quietly, implying that this relationship is illicit or forbidden. She knows that she shouldn't be there, but she can't help herself. She declares her love to him, but at the same time, she admits that she cannot break away from pride and vainer ties, and she cannot give herself to the narrator forever. So this implies that societal pressures such as class are a barrier in this love and that's further emphasized in the next section when it's revealed that Porphyria left her own gay feast gay meaning happy and it was possibly her engagement party because it was a happy party for her and she came in through the wind and rain because of a sudden thought of one so pale for love of her it was the thought that he was suffering that drove her to him tonight, made her come and see him, even though the weather was so rubbish. Her passion overtook social obligations and she left her party, representing wealth and luxury, to endure the dismal weather just to be with the speaker alone in this remote cottage. And he recognizes this. He realizes the love that she feels for him and he proudly declares, Porphyria worshipped me. And that displays his God complex, his desire for omnipotence. Be sure I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud. At last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell and still it grew. For him, his heart is swelling at the thought of possessing her. And with the thought of the power that he knows, he has realized now that he has over her. He says, while I debated what to do, oh, oh, disturbing, while I debated what to do, this line is ambiguous and highlights that his subsequent actions, what he's about to do, it's been calmly thought out, it's premeditated. This was not an impulsive act. It wasn't a heat of the moment, oh no, I don't know why I did this. He's really thinking about it like, hmm, what shall I do next? And he goes on and says, that moment she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. There's repetition here and it shows his increasing desperation to preserve her purity and goodness, which is a reference possibly to her virginity. He doesn't want any other man to touch her and because she's about to be engaged to someone else, he is consumed by jealousy. He says, I found a thing to do. And all her hair in one long yellow string, I wound three times her little throat around and strangled her. No pain felt she, I'm quite sure she felt no pain. There is a shocking twist here. The speaker suddenly murders Porphyria by strangling her with her own hair. 
it's tragic. He uses her own hair, a symbol of her beauty and her femininity, to kill her. Porphyria and her reader ignored all of the red flags and the signs of how deranged he was, and this climax takes everyone by surprise. The speaker attempts to justify his murder, and he claims that he's quite sure she felt no pain. And then he says, as a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily open to lids, again, laugh the blue eyes without a stain. So there's a simile here, and he compares her closed eyes to the beauty of nature like a shut flower holds a bee that's what her eyes are like and it's a really disturbing insight into the psychology of the speaker because he is likening her unnatural death to the natural reproductive process of flowers additionally this symbol of new life also contrasts juxtaposes how porphyria's life was cut short and he says her eyes appear happy and without a stain, so they're not tainted. By looking into her eyes, he feels like his mission was accomplished, his intentions have been achieved. They embody the state of pure purity and innocence that he longed to preserve. There is no stain on her and he's happy about it, he's laughing. And then the speaker unties her hair from her neck so that he can restore Porphyria's former beauty. I want to analyze the bit where he says, and I untighten next the tress about her neck, her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. Now, if you look carefully at the words next, tress, and neck, they all, they don't rhyme, but they all go eh, eh, eh. The vowel sound is the same, and that's something called assonance. And that eh, eh, eh demonstrates the rhythm behind his actions, like he's enjoying untying her hair. The conjunction and conveys the sense that this action is following some sort of procedure, like a lo logical order, and therefore connotes his methodical approach to the murder. We can then zoom into that bilabial plosive alliteration, buh, 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 blushed bright beneath. That perhaps, buh, 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 it could be mimicking his beating heart and his excitement and the thrill of it, but also that harsh sound could be symbolic of the violent act he's just committed. The image of blushed bright or oh, awful it really shows his warped perception because basically he's seeing the loss of blood like pumping around her corpse so she, like she's gone a bit red and he thinks she's blushing in response to his kiss and the use of the adjective bright further cements his distorted mindset because he's seeing beauty and light in death and murder the image of his burning kiss is oxymoronic, burning kiss. It demonstrates the pain his love caused her. And burning also has connotations of hell, reminding the reader of the sin he has committed. And it also makes him seem devil-like. Burning is also associated with passion, but that is made sinister and disturbing here because he's kissing a corpse. So it clearly depicts the narrator as a psychopath. It says, I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. The smiling, rosy little head. The speaker now enjoys being in control over the corpse of Porphyria. And there is a very dark image of her head drooping on his shoulder still with no indication of how much time has passed, how long has he been chilling there with her head on his shoulder. In the next bit, he expresses he is so glad her darling one wish would be heard. He is delusional. He believes that he's done Porphyria like a favor by killing her because he's granted her the realization of her darling one wish. She wanted to be with him forever. 
She wanted to be free from her social obligations. She didn't want to be engaged. You wanted to be with me. So I killed you and look, your wish came true. Now you're with me forever. And thus we sit together now and all night long we have not stirred and yet God has not said a word. At the end of the poem, the speaker has achieved what he wanted. And Browning paints an image of him sitting with Porphyria's corpse all night long. And the fact that God has not said a word, it suggests that he believes God condones this murder. Or I actually think if he's saying God couldn't even say anything to me, what are you going to do about it, God? I feel like that really shows him to be a megalomaniac. He's enjoying the power and the fact that he almost feels more powerful than God. No one can tell him anything. The poem is written in the form of a dramatic monologue. So we only hear about Porphyria from the unreliable narrator's perspective. And structurally, it's written in a single stanza with a regular rhyme scheme. And that mirrors the act of the murder that was premeditated, planned, and it wasn't just a spontaneous action. So that's your analysis. We've got some good quotations that we could definitely talk about in our exam. We've got language devices that we've analyzed, some structural techniques, but that's not quite enough. In your exam, you also need to talk about something called context. And that basically just means explain what was happening during the time the poem was written, or tell me something about the poet's life, and then link that to the poem. Why did they write it? Why? did the poet bother writing this poem? What message were they trying to give to the reader? Some interesting context points for Porphyria's lover are, Robert Browning was an important Victorian poet who married the very successful Elizabeth Barrett Browning and she wrote Sonnet 29. The Victorian era was known for its sense of morality, religious beliefs, social class, and attitudes towards women. There was a strong difference between the expected behavior in public and what people were actually getting up to in their private lives. Browning became known for dramatic monologues, often voiced by dark personas. Porphyria's lover, on one hand, presents an interesting perspective of a possessive and jealous murderer, but it also shows the consequences for women who go against the norms of society and disobey their families and society's expectations of them. So it's quite interesting for you to think, what was Browning's intention? What message was he trying to give the readers? And there you have it, a full analysis of Porphyria's Lover. I hope you found this video helpful. I hope it made Porphyria's Lover seem a little bit less complicated and scary. If you found it useful, please do give it a like and don't forget to check out the rest of the videos in this series.